For millennia, civilizations have been contemplating the sky, seeking to understand and explore the infinity of space. Today, all over the world, scientists and space programs attempt to unravel the mysteries of the universe, preparing missions that will put man back on the moon and one day on Mars. But all those experiments, all the work that we do on Earth and in space, ultimately they're aimed at achieving some higher goals. But what lies beyond the void of space, light years away on the exoplanets? Do they harbor life? Could there be extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe? I have an absolute conviction that there is life out there somewhere, because our universe is so vast. This question of life at Mars is so tantalizing, so it grabs us, it connects us to our own existence. Welcome to the far reaches of the universe, to the discovery of new worlds and yet to be understood cosmic phenomena. Thanks to the progress of science and new technologies, the cosmos is slowly but surely revealing itself to us. We understand how enormous the universe is and how many different ways we might need to explore to find what we're looking for. Join us on a unique journey of discovery, billions of light years away. Are you ready? Ever since the voyage of Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin in 1961, space exploration has never lost its momentum. Today, space is becoming even more accessible. Following government space agencies, new private sector players are positioning themselves to send man beyond the confines of our home planet. In the desert of New Mexico in the United States, the Virgin Galactic Company is finalizing its test flight campaign and plans to open its first suborbital flight in 2020. The reception hall is already set up to receive the first passengers. 600 customers have already pre-purchased their tickets for the sum of $250,000. Nearly 8,000 other candidates have been waitlisted. For this price, the six passengers will board the Spaceship 2 aircraft. At an altitude of 15,000 meters, the astronauts will be dropped by carrier aircraft, then propelled toward space to reach an altitude of more than 90 kilometers. For a few minutes, passengers experiencing weightlessness will be able to admire the Earth from their porthole. I'm Adam Stelzner. I'm a fellow at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the chief engineer of the Mars 2020 project. I very much support a space tourism as a way of, of educating people. Every human that's looked at the globe from space, seen that borderless continents, seen the air that encircles all of us, the oceans that flow past all of us, they have all returned with a much more keen understanding of how important and how connected humans are to one another and how important they are to the health of the planet. I'm Sarah Seeger, professor of planetary science and professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I think space tourism is a great idea for people who want to be able to, you know, see the beauty of Earth from, from afar. Astronauts have said that their worldview changes when they see how beautiful Earth is from above. This sort of desire and drive to protect our only home planet 
become stronger seeing Earth from, from afar. In Texas, American billionaire Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, has also launched into space tourism with his subsidiary, Blue Origin. His new Shepard rocket is making its final test flights before embarking its first passengers in early 2021. Six people will be able to voyage on board the capsule to reach the 95 kilometer altitude in just minutes. And the capsule's launcher is also reusable. After each launch, the main body of the rocket can return to land autonomously, while the passengers return to Earth thanks to parachutes attached to the capsule. I'm Jill Tarter. I'm the Emeritus Chair for SETI Research at the SETI Institute. I'm a really big supporter of that idea of finding a platform, finding a way for people to experience the planet Earth as a whole and to internalize uh, the fact that all of these artificial boundaries that we've placed on this planet make really no sense at all. Uh, the only boundary that really matters is that pale, thin, blue uh, boundary around the planet that's our atmosphere. And I, it's an amazing perspective and an all, you know, a life altering perspective. But future commercial flights may well take place aboard the International Space Station. In May of 2020, the SpaceX company owned by billionaire Elon Musk succeeded in sending two NASA astronauts into orbit around the Earth. Propelled by the Falcon 9 rocket, the two men aboard the Crew Dragon capsule were able to reach the International Station without any problems. Bob Bankin from SpaceX Demo 2 mission entering the International Space Station. Today, private astronauts can also spend time in orbit for short periods. It will cost close to $35,000 per night per passenger to use the station's facilities, such as air, internet, water, and toilets. To reach the station, astronauts will have to use capsules certified by NASA, such as the SpaceX Dragon capsule or those developed by Boeing. To use these propulsion systems, the cost of the trip will be much higher, nearing 55 million US dollars. By turning to the private sector, NASA expects to save money. Over the past 20 years, the American agency has spent $3 billion per year on operating costs of the International Space Station. These savings will enable the U.S. agency to direct its budget towards its flagship program, as declared by U.S. President Donald Trump in December of 2017. The directive I'm signing today will refocus America's space program on human exploration and discovery. It marks an important step in returning American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972 for long-term exploration and use. This time, we will not only plant our flag and leave our footprint, we will establish a foundation for an eventual mission to Mars and perhaps someday to many worlds beyond. Since this announcement, NASA's Artemis program is in full swing. $71 billion will be spent over the next five years on this ambitious program, whose goal is for the return of astronauts to the moon, one man and one woman by 2024. The SLS, Space Launch System rocket, and the space capsule that will carry the astronauts is being assembled. The first launch is planned for early 2021 for a test flight around the moon without crew, then a second, manned flight, will be made towards the end of 2022. And finally, the landing of a man and a woman on the moon's South Pole in 2024.
To this end, new spacesuits have been designed. They now allow a much greater range of movement than before. Astronauts can now bend their knees, turn their pelvis, or raise their arms more easily. The suits are also more modular, made up of inner layers that can be positioned or removed depending on the outside temperature, which on the moon varies from 150 degrees Celsius to minus 150 degrees Celsius. The suits also prevent lunar dust from infiltrating and sticking everywhere. Once on the moon, the Americans intend to stay there for some time. The plan is to create a permanent lunar base as early as 2028. But to live and work on the moon for extended periods of time, astronauts will need protection from cosmic and solar radiation. My name is Oleg Novinsky. I'm an instructor, test cosmonaut of the Cosmonaut Corps, Roscosmos. Research is being done to protect people from radiation. That is, how radiation affects living cells. If we are going to fly somewhere into outer space, naturally, we should get such knowledge about what materials protect best. We have a lot of experiments conducted on board the station about how solar radiation affects different materials completely differently. Scientists are studying which material is better able to withstand this huge temperature difference and the sun's radiation and then come up with some materials that can work long and reliably in space. The AI Space Factory may have found a solution. This New York architectural firm is the big winner of the 3D Habitat Challenge, launched by NASA to invent the future homes of the Moon or Mars. Competitors have three days to print a building to one-third scale using the resources found on the planets like basalt. By mixing basalt with plastic fibers, AI created a material more resistant and durable than concrete, capable of acting as a barrier to cosmic radiation and which does not deform under high thermal amplitudes. But to survive on the Moon or on Mars, astronauts will have to face another major challenge. A journey into space means living confined with your crew, sometimes for a very long period of time. In February 2020, American astronaut Christina Koch returned to the Earth after an 11-month stay aboard the International Space Station, breaking the female longevity record. After 328 days away from Earth, even for shorter stays, managing the tensions and even conflicts that can arise between crew members living behind closed doors is of paramount importance. Space agencies regularly duplicate this kind of confinement on land, but the International Space Station is still the best laboratory for monitoring a crew's interactions in real-life situations over the long term. Harmony between crew members relies first and foremost on the selection process. We go through psychological tests at the selection stage. We even had a study when a person is left in a room for five days. The room is soundproof. There are no windows, nothing. There's no direct communication with the team of doctors who are watching you. And for five days, you work in this enclosed room. And from the first day to the last, you work normally, that is, in the afternoon. Well, relatively, you look at the clock, you work during the day, go to bed by the clock, and for three days between these days should work continuously. That is, the so-called continuous operation of the RND. Doctors look at how long you can work in a confined space alone without communication with the ground. Borishenko Andrei Ivanovich, pilot cosmonaut of two space flights, hero of Russia. At the stage of crew formation and after the crew is formed, our psychologists give a prognosis for the crew. That is, they determine potentially whether conflicts can arise in this crew. If they arise, then how far they can go, whether it will affect the work, the execution of the task, and so on. They give this kind of forecast for each crew, and as far as I know, forecasts are fairly accurate. 
Unfortunately, in the history of manned space exploration, there are cases when there were some omissions at the selection stage. And not all potential astronauts could become astronauts on precisely because of psychology. There was a case when a crew was formed, two people managed to ruin their relations so much with each other at the preparatory stage, still on the ground, that the crew was removed from training, disbanded, and subsequently neither of them went into space. Six months to travel 400 million kilometers to reach Mars. One month once on Mars until the next flight window opens. And then another 13 months for the trip back to Earth, passing by Venus. The crew members on the mission to Mars will have to learn to live together for more than one and a half years. NASA anticipates a launch sometime around 2030. In South Texas, the CEO of SpaceX has a completely different take. For Elon Musk, man must go to Mars not to explore it, but to colonize it. Man must become an interplanetary species. I am Marika Branchesi, an astrophysicist, and I work at the Gran Sasso Science Institute, and I am also the researcher of Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare. We don't have to have limits, so I don't know in thousands of years what will happen to, to human beings and what will be a big discovery, what, what will change. So far, they are only science fiction, but we don't know for the future. I think that uh, we need pioneering scientists that uh, try to discover, try to think also to something that seems really all, only science fiction at this point. And Elon Musk has every intention of turning his science fiction dream into reality. Um, okay, great, great. He's currently building prototypes of a spaceship capable of taking the first settlers to Mars. 50 meters high, the capsule, named Starship, will be able to carry up to 100 people on board. To propel it, the company will build the most powerful rocket imagined to date. The Super Heavy. Nine meters in diameter, 68 meters high, and equipped with 37 engines. A rocket that will blast the Starship capsule off the ground and out of Earth's gravitational pull. Once in orbit, the capsule will be able to refuel at an orbital service station. The spacecraft will then be able to leave Earth's vicinity and head for the Red Planet. After six months of travel, the capsule will land on Mars vertically, disembarking the first settlers. Elon Musk plans to send 1,000 ships to create a permanent base. And even if Mars is still today a red, stark, and inhospitable desert, SpaceX has already found its first passenger, Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maisawa. At the very least, if Maisawa is unable to go to Mars, this private astronaut will voyage around the moon aboard Starship in 2023, enough to prove the reliability of the rocket and the feasibility of the project before settling happens on Mars. The colonization of the Red Planet is also seen by some as a solution to protecting the human species. Everyone knows that if an asteroid with a diameter of at least about 10 kilometers flies to visit us on Earth, then the history of mankind will end. 
We cannot avoid this at the moment. But if, finally, we learn to fly to other stars, and there we find planets suitable for life, and create colonies where our great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren will live, then in this case, humanity has a chance. With such a danger that we still can't deflect, that we are unable to prevent, it will lead to the end of our planet. The threat of an asteroid actually striking Earth is an event taken very seriously by space agencies. On February 15, 2013, an asteroid 20 meters in diameter flew over Russia and disintegrated in the sky, releasing a shockwave 20 to 30 times greater than that produced by the Hiroshima bomb. Tens of thousands of windows were blown out and a thousand people were injured. Agencies estimate that there are several thousand dangerous asteroids greater than 100 meters in diameter that would cause considerable damage. Such events could occur every 10,000 years. Johns Hopkins University and NASA have developed DART, or the Double Asteroid Redirection Test spacecraft capable of deflecting asteroids. To validate the concept and technology, engineers will test this craft by targeting Dimorphos, a small 160-meter asteroid that orbits around a larger asteroid. It is located 11 million kilometers from Earth and is not on our planet's trajectory. DART will be launched on July 22, 2021 and should arrive at its destination on September 30, 2022. An impact at 23,700 kilometers per hour should be enough to change the speed and trajectory of Dimorphos. The impact will also be filmed by the small Italian cube satellite Lycia, which will travel aboard DART and eject a few days earlier. Lycia will also study the ejection velocity of the particles produced during the formation of the impact crater. But in order to make an accurate assessment of the damage caused, the European Space Agency is prepared to send the Hera satellite, which will arrive around the two asteroids around 2026. Hera will be tasked with accurately measuring the size, shape, and mass of Dimorphos. Two more Cube satellites will accompany Hera. Their mission is to analyze Dimorphos' gravitational field and internal structure. They will also study the mineralogical composition of the asteroids and make several numerical models of the impact crater. In the final phase of the mission, the nanosatellite will attempt to land in order to better understand the surface properties of the asteroids. While we wait for humans to escape meteorites or settle on Mars to create a new civilization, the red planet is regularly visited. Since the first probes were sent in the 1960s, some 20 successful missions have followed one another. Orbiters and rovers are constantly probing the surface of Mars, sending back even more extraordinary images, such as the ice that has accumulated at Mars' poles. Kennedy Space Center in Florida, NASA is preparing to send its brand new rover to explore the Martian surface. Its name is Perseverance, and it will launch in the summer of 2020 to arrive on Mars in February of 2021. The 1,000 kilogram robot will take over from its predecessors.
back on the Mars Exploration Rovers mission with the twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity, we discovered that the surface of Mars had been covered in some liquid water. And that's very important because we know from here on Earth that where there's liquid water, there's life. But those missions couldn't tell us some important things about the water. Was it sweet or salty, acidic or basic? In short, was that ancient wet Mars habitable for life? Well, Curiosity was designed to go and answer that question. And the answer is yes. Of the conditions that would support life on the surface of Mars existed about the same time that life began on our planet. Kind of a striking state of, of uh, our solar system. That at, at the same time, the conditions to support life existed on two planets, and we know life started here. The goal of the new Perseverance rover is to find traces of past life. Geologists have already selected the Jezero crater as a landing site. This crater, located north of the Martian equator, has traces of an ancient lake and a delta. The accumulated sediments could possibly show the potential presence of organic molecules or signs of past bacterial life. The search for life in our solar system is, is still going strong. Like on Mars in particular, you know, there's still a chance that there could be life in pockets below the surface where there is a bit of water. For this mission to succeed, Perseverance will be equipped with a more efficient landing system than its predecessors. As it descends by parachute, it will photograph the surface of Mars, detecting steep areas in real time. If an area is considered dangerous, Perseverance will be able to change direction and divert to a safer area. And to ensure a smooth landing, Adam and his team have devised a clever system that has already proven itself. So in our case, we fly with a propulsion system bolted to the back of the rover. We call it the descent stage. And we fly monolithically together until about 20 meters, 22 meters above the surface of Mars. And then we lower the rover below its jet backpack, the descent stage, until the rover's weight is taken up by the surface of Mars. And then we cut the rover free and fly the descent stage to a safe distance. That last maneuver, the lowering of the rover and the two bodies descending to Mars, is called the sky crane maneuver. And that was the little bit of crazy that our team developed. The all-new American rover Perseverance will also be tasked with preparing samples of Martian soil to be brought back to Earth in the future. The scientists have been telling us to really unlock the mysteries of Mars. They've got to bring a piece of Mars back to Earth. It's a lot of work. It takes more than one mission. It takes, in fact, we think, three missions to make it happen. Mars 2020 is the first of those. Perseverance will have two years to select and prepare more than 20 samples that will be sent back to Earth. During a second mission, another rover will place these samples on board a rocket. Once in orbit, the samples will be transferred to a satellite for return to Earth around 2030. I think the most important question we're trying to unpack, at least for the average person on the street, is this question of life. We know now that the conditions to support life existed when life first started here on Earth. The conditions to support life were existed on Mars. Did life ever occur on Mars? Is it still alive? Can we see evidence either way? That's the kind of holy grail of science questions that we're hoping to get at with the idea of returning samples from the surface of Mars. But Perseverance won't be the only rover to touch Martian soil in 2021. A new player is positioning itself in the race for Mars, China. 
For the first time in its history, the Chinese will send probes to another planet. The Tianwen-1 mission will orbit a satellite and lower a lander and rover on Martian soil near the site of Utopia Planitia. This demonstration of Chinese technology to the current major space players is also intended to be scientific. The Chinese will study the morphology and geology of the Martian soil, as well as the distribution of ice. They also hope to find signs of life buried underground. And there are technological surprises also coming from the United Arab Emirates. Emirati engineers, in collaboration with American universities, have designed the HOPE satellite, which will orbit the Red Planet for two years. Its mission? To record data from multiple sources, including temperature, wind, water vapor, and dust in order to provide a better understanding of the dynamic phenomena that influence Martian climate and atmosphere. The arrival of the HOPE satellite to Mars's orbit in 2021 will correspond with the 50th anniversary of the creation of the United Arab Emirates, making this a highly symbolic mission which confirms the UAE as the first Arab nation to send a spacecraft to another planet. European side, the European Space Agency and its Russian partner, Roscosmos, are also preparing to send the Rosalind Franklin rover as part of the ExoMars program. Originally meant to take place in 2020, its departure to Mars has been postponed to 2022 due to various technical problems, particularly with its parachutes and descent module. The ESA-built robot will also be used to detect signs of past life in the Oxia Planum Basin. Equipped with a drill capable of digging up to two meters deep, the robot can capture soil samples unaltered by cosmic radiation that constantly bombards the Martian surface. If we um, explore Mars, and find evidence of extinct or even extant subsurface life on Mars. And we can show that that life is not related to life here on Earth. That is, life did not cross space in rocks and, and infect another planet. Uh, if we find an independent second genesis on Mars, we will know that there is life everywhere. Life will be ubiquitous. If you get two origins of life in one solar system, you know it's happening everywhere. If life was in fact able to colonize several planets in our solar system, couldn't it also be present on other planets throughout the universe? In 2019, Swiss researchers Didier Queloz and Michel Mayor were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering in 1995 the first planet orbiting a star other than our sun. Nicknamed 51 Pegasi b, this exoplanet is located 50 light years away. Since the discovery, the search for exoplanets has only increased. There are hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. And there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So the number of stars is almost uncountable. We think nearly every star has planets orbiting them. To date, telescopes deployed on Earth and in space have already identified more than 4,100 exoplanets, each orbiting a star. The largest contribution comes from the American Kepler Space Telescope, launched in 2009. Since then, a bit more is known about the nature of some exoplanets. We're actually finding all kinds of crazy planetary systems and crazy planets out there. Like there are some planets the size of Earth 
that are so close to their star and the planets would be heated so hot by the star that the surface would be consist of in parts like liquid lava lakes. Not from volcanoes, but just from heating of the, the star itself. And we think some of those hot super Earths won't even have atmospheres because they're so hot. And we have an example we're hoping is out there, and it might be. And we call the planets water worlds. And these planets would be like scaled up versions of Jupiter's icy moons. And it would be a planet we imagine is like 50% water by mass, that it's just like an icy body move. It's a planet with a thick steam atmosphere, and it would have a giant ocean. And beneath the ocean, where the pressure of the ocean would cause the water to solidify and be a type of water, high pressure water ice. So we don't know everything that's out there. We do know there are a lot of mysterious types of planets and that planets literally come in all sizes and masses and orbits. In 2018, the Americans sent their brand new TESS space telescope into orbit. Its mission? To find new Earth-sized planets orbiting small stars near our solar system. TESS is capable of scanning 85% of the sky, an area 350 times larger than that observed by Kepler. To find these planets, TESS relies on the amount of light observed. The most popular way to find a planet now has to do with planets that are aligned very specially. They're aligned precisely so that the planet orbits the star, as seen from the telescope. Now, a planet could be oriented this way, Around, orbiting this way around its star as projected on the sky, and you would never see it go in front of the star. When the planet goes in front of the star, we call that a transit. And the starlight, although the star is just a point of light, will drop by a very tiny amount. This drop in brightness is very, very tiny. It's like 1% drop in brightness or a tiny fraction of a percent. And you're looking at lots of stars at once. Some of those stars will drop in brightness because there's a planet going in front of it. And that's the first step in finding a planet by the transit technique. However, this decrease in brightness is sufficient for scientists to calculate the size of the exoplanet and its orbit. By combining this data with the mass of the planet, we can deduce its density and know whether the planet is more rocky or gaseous. In January 2020, the TESS telescope made its first discovery of a rocky planet 20% larger than the size of the Earth. Its name, TOI 700D. Located 101 light years away, TOI 700D revolves around its sun, a red dwarf in 37 days. This planet is of particular interest to researchers because it is located in what is referred to as a habitable zone. The habitable zone, or Goldilocks zone, of an exoplanet is when the distance to the star it orbits maintains temperatures that allow the existence of liquid water on the surface of the planet. Too close to its star, the water vaporizes, too far away, and the water turns to ice. If water makes life possible on Earth, it is thought that a similar environment could produce the same effects on another planet. TOI 700D has now joined a small circle of potentially habitable planets discovered to date. Right now, there's probably a few dozen planets in their so-called Goldilocks zone. Out of these planets in the so-called Goldilocks zone, we don't know which ones are actually have the right surface temperature to have liquid water. We don't know that until we can study the atmospheres and understand what the atmospheres are doing to the planet's surface. But is there water on these planets? The answer may well come from the James Webb International Space Telescope, currently being assembled in Maryland in the United States. The result of cooperation between Europe, Canada, and the USA, this giant telescope is expected to be launched into orbit in 2021. One of its many tasks will be to scan the atmospheres of the exoplanets that exist in the habitable zone around the size of the Earth. By working with infrared, the telescope will be able to identify a large number of molecules with chemical signatures linked to life, such as water, ozone, and methane.
At the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, researchers have devised a special device to directly observe exoplanets while filtering out the blinding glare from starlight. Starshade is a giant, specially shaped screen. And Starshade would be tens of meters in diameter. And it would formation fly in space tens of thousands of kilometers from a space telescope. And Starshade will block out the starlight, so only planet light enters the telescope. With this enormous flower-shaped screen, it will be possible to directly observe the planets and their atmosphere without the interference of direct starlight. The engineers were inspired by origami to find an innovative way to fold the structure of the screen so that it could fit on top of a rocket. Starshade could be operational in about 10 years. All of these innovations bring us a new look at the universe, as well as the hope of one day finding signs of life on the surface of new worlds. But for some scientists, life may also exist in more evolved forms. Could there be other intelligent beings? Other civilizations in the universe? Since the 1960s, researchers have been relentlessly tracking the sky, hoping to capture a signal sent by an extraterrestrial source. We've had a number of false positives over the years that got us really excited, and it took a while for us to figure out that it was our own technology that we were detecting and being fooled by. So no, we haven't detected a signal. If we had, you'd know about it, because we certainly intend to tell the world, but we have over all of these years, made our searches much, much better. So we can look at much more of the spectrum, much more rapidly today than we ever could in the past. And, and that's kind of how you keep going day to day as you try and figure out how to make the search better so that someday success may be possible. The recording of a first extraterrestrial signal could well be captured by the billionaire and ex-Russian physicist Yuri Milner. In 2015, Milner invested $100 million over 10 years towards the search for intelligent life. His Breakthrough Listen program aims to improve receivers and increase the number of frequencies scanned. And his goals are ambitious to listen to no less than a million stars and the 100 galaxies closest to Earth. We're trying to find signals, electromagnetic radiation, uh, that is different than what nature produces. So we use large radio telescopes, and at those frequencies, we look for signals that are compressed in frequency. They show up at only one channel on the radio dial. Nature can't do that. It spreads emissions over a lot of frequencies. The Breakthrough Listen program uses the most powerful radio telescopes to date to try and make this gamble a success. These include the Green Banks Radio Telescope in the U.S. state of Virginia, the Parkes Telescope in Australia, and the latest Meerkat Antenna Array in South Africa, inaugurated in 2018. Since the start of the project, these telescopes have recorded massive amounts of data. The challenge is to isolate a signal of interest from the thousands of other radio signals from satellites, television stations, or other cosmic phenomena. To sift through these frequencies, scientists use artificial intelligence, as well as sharing the data online to speed up analysis. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is also of interest to the Chinese, who have joined forces with the Breakthrough Listen program to make their new fast radio telescope available to researchers. 
operational since 2019, this instrument, installed in a rural area of southwestern China, is the largest radio telescope in the world to date. Built in the heart of a valley, it measures 500 meters in diameter. The aluminum panels that make up its surface can be oriented to listen to different regions of the universe. With this giant ear pointing at the sky, researchers hope one day to record an actual extraterrestrial signal. While waiting for contact from beyond the void, other scientists are looking for signals from the cosmos of a completely different nature. After decades of waiting, on September 14th, 2015, two American detectors, 3,000 kilometers apart, recorded an identical signal almost at the same time, a signal that would upend our understanding of the universe. The breakthrough of the century, gravitational waves exist. After the earth-shaking detection of gravitational waves in the U.S., breakthrough discovery could change the way we think about the universe. Oh my galaxy, we found gravitational waves. For the first time, scientists have been able to detect and confirm the existence of gravitational waves. Waves that form during cataclysmic events, thousands of light years away. Waves predicted by Albert Einstein 100 years earlier in his theory of gravitation, but which were thought to be too weak to be detected. Such a discovery opens up great new perspectives for scientists. Gravitational waves are uh, really a new way to observe the universe. It's very similar to the moment in which Galileo pointed the telescope to the sky, because it's really a new way to see what, what before what was invisible. By comparing theoretical models with signals recorded by the detectors, scientists were able to locate the origin of these gravitational waves. The first signal of uh, um, gravitational waves detected by Earth came from the coalescence of two black holes. These two black holes were pretty heavy, almost 30 solar masses, and uh, they merge uh, very distant from us, 1.2 billion of years from us. These gravitational waves propagate through the universe and through thousands of galaxies, and then it arrived in Earth uh, the 14th of uh, September 2015. The success of this major discovery is down to American researchers Weiss, Barris, and Thorne. After more than 30 years of effort, they succeeded in improving the sensitivity of their interferometer. an instrument composed of two arms, several kilometers long, in which lasers circulate. During its passage on Earth, the gravitational wave is able to modify the length of the arms of the instrument, an infinitesimal variation that can be recorded by lasers. For this technological and scientific breakthrough, the three scientists were awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. Since this first discovery, black hole signatures have been detected. Measurement campaigns have also identified the collision of two neutron stars, offering a wealth of knowledge. During the merger of the two neutron stars, we discover how heavy elements form. One of these elements is gold. I think gold is very important in our life, and we didn't know how gold would come before. And now we have uh, the explanation where these heavy elements uh, are in, uh, in Earth. We are make, made, so human beings are made of uh, heavy elements also. And so where they come from, we didn't know before. Now, gravitational waves open up a new field of observation of the universe. We certainly will know more about the expansion of the universe. We certainly know more about the origin of the universe. We certainly know more about how uh, extremely heavy objects like supermassive black hole can be at the beginning of the universe. Understanding the laws that govern the cosmos, 
exploring new worlds, observing extreme phenomena billions of light years away. Day after day, scientists around the world are mobilizing to push our understanding of the universe ever further. But the quest for understanding the unknown profoundly resonates with our own existence. The people have always wondered what's out there. And as humans, we've always been driven to explore. And so the sense of like exploration and trying to understand what's around us and what our place in the universe is will always be there. Curiosity is the spark, and exploration is the fire that burns from it. Curiosity, that is our fundamental human superpower. And I, I think it's our greatest attribute. Um, and it's our greatest tool to solve problems and make the world a better place and keep the world the beautiful place we evolved in. We are giving humanity the opportunity to get to know itself better and to find the right path of development in space, which must be found and achieved. How do we have a long future for all life on this planet? And it's a unique opportunity to see ourselves in a different context. So I think it's the space program and space research is enormously beneficial to the planet itself, to all of us. A cosmic perspective is not a luxury, it's a necessity. If we're ever gonna get it right,